Welcome to Early Medieval Continental Europe, 500s to 900s AD. This is Melinda Cole Klein. After 476 AD, former Roman territories fell into chaos and disorder. Farms and towns were raided for their goods and supplies, while invading Germanic tribes made their way across the European continent. In time, these invading forces would settle and establish kingdoms of their own. In the absence of Roman rule and the power of law, of course enforced by the authority of the military, provinces of the Roman West transitioned towards new relationships in which loyalty between ruler and his military took on new meetings of obligation and service. While the provinces of the former Roman Empire in the West lay in ruins by the end of the 400s, the Eastern reorganization of the imperial government and political structures consolidated to become the Byzantine Empire. And this surviving empire of Rome took the window of opportunity to seize power in Italy. Shortly after the fall, the Byzantine army, under orders from Emperor Justinian, reconquered Italy for the Byzantine Empire. While this effort was short-lived, it had costly effects to trade, as Rome, as a port city, because of the damage done to the city by the Byzantine forces, was impacted. In the meantime, in northern Italy, the Lombards invaded, taking control of what is present-day Tuscany. As will be the pattern established across former Roman provinces, Germanic leaders would create centers of power in the absence of Roman rule. How similar or different this new government would be as compared to Rome was tied to one key factor, how Romanized the invaders were. The Lombards were Roman-like in manner, customs, and procedures. So it is no surprise the Lombard government established in Tuscany would be similar to provincial rule as it had long existed during imperial times. Out of all of the Germanic kingdoms that would develop, the longest lasting would be that of the Franks, established by King Clovis in the 480s. It would be under his leadership that the Frankish tribes united. It would be King Clovis who would establish Paris as the Frankish capital. Unlike in Spain, the Frankish kingdom would create a monarchy in which rule would be inherited. Iberia is the peninsula containing present-day Spain and Portugal. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Germanic tribes, the Visigoths and the Vandals, had somewhat conquered the indigenous population of the Roman Greek Celtics established in Spain. In Spain, the German conquest was similar to Italy, except that the Visigoths had succession problems. Deciding on rulership created wars between competing leaders. In Spain, a hereditary styled monarchy used by the Roman Empire was not practiced. Like used in Macedonia at the time of Alexander the Great's father, Philip II, Spanish internal strife resorted to committing assassinations to be king. Because of this practice, this kept German tribes competing against each other for power. This left themselves vulnerable from attack by a foreign power. And the invaders did arrive. Muslims from North Africa in a seven-year period effectively conquered the peninsula in the name of Islam. 
This Muslim conquest was part of a broader pattern of expansion of the new Islamic kingdoms established in former Roman territories located in the eastern Mediterranean and North Africa. The term Reconquista is used to describe the over 700 year process by which noble Spanish families, both Greek Roman Celt and the invading Visigoths, set their minds to the task of retaking Spain away from their Muslim rulership in order to regain their country. It would begin in 722 AD and officially end January 1st, 1492 with the fall of the Alhambra Castle in Granada, the last Muslim stronghold. In the northern, mountainous, Romanized areas of Spain in particular, its residents united to fight the Muslims. There were some early successes. In time, the noble warriors of the Iberian Northwest were successful in obtaining their independence. Prior to this, during the reign of Charlemagne, the Franks had expelled Muslim Moors who had invaded their territory by way of Spain. As the Spanish noble families consolidated power in effort to repel Muslim forces, the pattern of conquest was completed over seven centuries of war. As you can see on this map, the pattern of creating Spanish kingdoms took on a distinctly north to south pattern. As medieval Spain began to take shape after the invasion of Muslim armies, the popularity of the Reconquista led to a more effective military fighting force. Romanized Celtic Spaniards joined up and fought back. Early winds helped. By the 750s, forces in Galicia, if you want to look at this map, were able to drive out the Moors. By the mid-1800s, Spanish nobles had effectively led armies south towards Lisbon in what is now modern Portugal. This military presence in Spain created, over the centuries, a strong belief by the Spanish population to honor and respect military achievement. These were ancient ancestral traditions practiced by the Greeks, Romans, and Celts who settled in Spain. However, the Reconquista that lasted over 700 years cemented the character of the Spanish people to become united against foreign aggression. All the while, war was a part of daily life. Additionally, the religious and cultural differences between the Christianized Spaniards and Muslim invaders drove the need for Iberian armies to work together against a common enemy. This resulted in feudal relationships created between noble families and their knights. El Cid, as a heroic tale and Spanish literature, was based on a true story of a Spanish hero. The stories of El Cid feature this knight as the main character in the Reconquista poem by Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar. This military hero is honor bound to serve the King of Castile and Leon. Ultimately, El Cid would successfully lead army campaigns, culminating with the conquest by Spanish forces of Valencia in 1094. The poem, fashioned after the heroic epics by the Greeks and the Romans, is considered the oldest surviving Spanish poem of the period. This poetic history is not to be confused with Don Quixote, the fictional and humorous Spanish knight immortalized by Miguel de Cervantes, written over 500 years later. 
Saint Benedict of Nursia was a monk remembered best of all for a set of rules he wrote for monks to abide by and live by. Monastic life brought together in a religious community priests, clerks from a variety of backgrounds and cultural ethnicities. While Catholic authority established institutional rules and regulations, St. Benedict offered to find common ground for these monks living austere lives. His rules favored moderation in all things. The rule of St. Benedict is organized in 73 chapters. It suggests with examples how monks should divide up their time during the day and evening before and after times of prayer. It encouraged monks to be inventive, apply their talents to craft production, and above all, not to be idle. It ranges across many subjects and suggests, for example, the types of clothing a monk should wear, how to receive guests, and when it would be appropriate to allow the admission of people from the local community to be admitted into the monastery. These rules were not intended to create a perfect monk, but instead offered tolerable guidelines. All the while, the early sections tackle the age-old issues of the body and how to regulate food and drink, along with emphasizing manual labor. In time, the followers of St. Benedict would create their own religious order known as the Benedictines. St. Benedict's rules were long-lasting and used as commonly observed for 1,500 years or roughly to the present. At church and historical websites, you may read this list of do's and don'ts regarding a monk's life and true Christian piety. Each monastic house was run by an abbot who retained complete authority over the monks in his charge. As the monastic movement grew in popularity, strength, authority, and wealth, the power of the Pope as head of the Christian Church in the West grew as well. From the 300s, monks were encouraged to live austere lives and not engage in sexual activity. St. Augustine, an early church father, professed that celibacy was the path to holiness and salvation in seeking God's grace. St. Augustine set an importance to sexual behavior. As an early church father, he advocated that by rejecting pleasure of the body, one could find God's grace and salvation. However, if an individual did not reject the practice of sexual relations, it must serve a procreative purpose and only within the bonds of marriage. From the 300s until today, the Christian Church became the authority to watch over sexual behavior. In time, lay people and holy ones perform services necessary to grant men and women the freedom to have sex or not. Shortly after the fall of Roman rule, Pope Gregory set in motion the direction of the Roman Catholic Church. One goal was to civilize and Christianize the invading Germans. While this would take generations to complete, it would create the foundation from which European civilization would emerge out of the ashes of the Roman Empire. Pope Gregory sent missionaries to areas hardest hit by Germanic invasions. This included England, the provinces to the north in present-day Germany, and to the Frankish Kingdom to the west. This diplomatic, political, and spiritual effort was accomplished through the monastic movement. 
This format was a model of Christianized living with solitary monks in rural residence living hermit-like as priests. These solitary souls dedicated their lives to serve God. In a profound political mood, King Clovis and his wife adopted Christianity and made it the national faith of the Franks. His hunch was correct. One religion unified the Frankish kingdom. With King Clovis becoming Christian, his authority was acknowledged in a broader sense. In essence, this political move set into motion the post-Roman Germanic European civilization that would expand during the Dark Ages in the West. Conversion in the Kingdom of the Franks was voluntary and it assisted with the assimilation of Roman, Greek, Celtic population with the invading Franks. The Kingdom of the Franks expanded its power grip over weaker neighboring areas. This would lead to empire building. This imperial power would later be expanded yet again under Charles the Great otherwise known as Charlemagne, King of the Franks from 768 until his death in 814 AD. All the while wise and powerful German invaders married into the propertied Gaul-Roman elites creating a new aristocratic class. In 800 AD Charlemagne, then King of the Franks, journey to Rome to help Pope Leo III, the head of the Catholic Church, who was barely clinging to power in the face of the rebellious conditions. On Christmas Day, Charlemagne and his family attended a crowded Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, also attended by Franks and Romans. Quite unexpectedly, as the story goes, quote, as the king rose from praying before the tomb of Apostle Peter, Pope Leo placed a golden crown on his head." End of quote. Charles the Great had become the first Roman emperor since 476. This did not give a rebirth to the Roman Empire in the West. However, Charlemagne was German. What this event did come to symbolize was the emergence of a new civilization known as Europe. During a series of campaigns, Charlemagne expanded his territory to include Brittany, Saxony, what is present-day northern Germany, and northern Italy, south to Rome, known to history as the Carolingian Empire. By the early Middle Ages, an emerging medieval society came into being. This led to a new king-to-subject relationship to form. When governments can no longer defend their subjects, it becomes important for free individuals to form alliances. In this time, powerful lords supported by their loyal military offered local subjects protection. This, these military men, knights and vassals, gave their service and obedience in exchange for land and political power. The people who were protected but did not offer military service, these were the serfs. These people were the peasantry who worked the land and received protection without having to fight. At least that's the theory. In a broader sense, serfs were unfree citizens. This political alliance between landowners and their vassals, a class of military knights and property dukes, created an organized system of government which was called feudalism. As powerful noble families competed against each other, for possession of large tracts of land, 
these landowners in turn needed to establish a strong military presence to retain their property. This military presence was accomplished through successful negotiation of terms of service between talented military men and the land-owning elite. Payment for these vassals in service to their lord took the form of political power and or land grants. So the practice of granting lands to vassals started and continued. These grants of land were known as fiefdoms. Mounted armed horsemen warriors began to dominate the new military efforts with larger horses and the introduction of the stirrup. They carried spears and swords and were dressed in coats of mail. This was of course an expensive practice to be a vassal and it took time to become a skilled knight of the realm. Not only did vassals go to battle, but they also presided in the Lord's judicial court representing the political and legal authority in the region. In addition, vassals were known to collect taxes for his Lord. A vassal's military service usually required about 40 days of active service a year. Running the Lord's manor took work. A well-appointed one had fields, ponds for fish, a mill for grinding grains, a church, a village, and workshops all geared around agricultural production. Nobles and their families enjoyed unlimited status, while agricultural workers, the serfs, belonged to the manor. In exchange for protection offered by the Lord, they tilled the fields and brought in the harvest. Feudal states would take time to consolidate their power. Typically, they were established around family dynasties with autocratic control over landed estates. These feudal princely kingdoms in time would become the monarchies of Europe, from Britain to Spain and Italy, west to France and east to the kingdom of the Rus'.